Great. Thank you. Well, just a few, a few words um, about Enrico uh, as we as we get started, and you'll forgive me. I, I have to read off of this. <laughs> <laughs> so. You know, it, it's it's a pleasure to have Enrico here, and especially because he just came off of a sabbatical in the Netherlands. The Netherlands. I was going to say the name, but I couldn't pronounce it. Wageningen, Wageningen, in the Netherlands, uh, where he's been he's been really excited to do some work that it turns out is a slightly different than what he initially intended <laughs> to go there for. But this is what science is all about, which is which is fantastic. So Enrico uh, received his BSc in Biological Sciences at the University of Milan. Um, he also received an MSc in Molecular Cell and Developmental Biology for work on maize embryogenesis. Yes, that's right. In the lab of uh, Enrico Payne Arcoli, Ottaviano. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and Mirella Sariola. Um, he received a PhD in the lab of Anne-Marie Meyer. Harry Hogue and Herman, Herman Spike, Spike. Spike uh, and did a postdoc on Arabidopsis vascular development in the lab of Thomas Burleth at the University of Toronto. Yeah. Enrico has been here since 2004 and he's been a, a very active participant and member of the department and I am extremely pleased that he's a member of our department and that he's, he's here with us. Thank you. So Thank you with much. that, I'd like to let Enrico tell you about everything that he's been doing. Okay, thank you very much, Declan, and <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk to you. Oh, thanks for the lines. Yes, that's perfect. Thank you. Um, for the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about what uh, my lab has been doing to uh, understand. Sorry, I'm just going to move the mouse here. Okay. So I'm going to move it out of the way. Maybe like this. Um, We've been doing to understand how veins are patterned in, uh, in leaves. But <clears throat> before we get into that, I wanted to, uh, um, to introduce you to the amazing group of people without whom nothing that I will be telling you later today would be impossible. And during the talk, I will connect uh, who with, with what. Uh, but because I will not have the time to tell you everything these people did over the years, um, I'd just like to uh, take the opportunity right now and thank publicly Tyler, Megan, Ozama, Jason, Carla, Lynn, Philip, Ira, Sri, Priyanka, Anmo, Brindy, Teresa, and Drew for all the time and energy that they put in their research. And uh, of course, what research are we talking about? Well, these uh, the inanimate objects that we manufacture uh, like this car over here, but it's the same for your phones, your uh, laptops, your bike. Uh, these objects, they don't grow, they don't divide, and uh, they don't differentiate. Um, all things that live in organism uh, seem to be able to do uh, without any apparent effort. But for these transformations to take place, cells have to grow, they need to divide and they need to differentiate according to uh, preferential or even in some cases exclusive orientations or directions. And because cells in multicellular organisms are organized in tissues, as you can see here, these uh, orientations or directions need to be coordinated between uh, cells within tissues and across tissues. And a classical example of this is the, uh, the formation of the hairs on the fruit fly wing. As you can see here, these hairs that form from a single cell, they all point in one direction, the one that I'm pointing at right now over there. So um, what, how are these directions specified within individual cells? And how are these, uh, directions within individual cells aligned with the directions of the neighboring cells. Now, in both plants and animals, the uh, segregation of cellular compartments, cellular products like proteins, for example, uh, like the ones that, I'm, that are here in red or in uh, yellow over here, to one side of the cell, provide the cell with some sort of an internal compass, 
that points in a certain direction. And uh, the internal compasses of all of these cells are then aligned with one another through processes that typically require cell-cell communication. And in animals where this has been studied extensively, um, one of the most common ways this uh, cell communication and this alignment of these cellular asymmetries, or as we call them, cell polarities, are aligned is through the direct interaction between cells, typically through the uh, interaction, direct interaction of proteins that protrude uh, from the plasma membrane. For, for example, here you see the red uh, protein protrudes from the right side of the cell on the left and interacts with the yellow protein that protrudes from the plasma membrane from the right side of the plasma, the left side of the plasma membrane of the right cell. But this kind of interaction cannot happen in plant because of a cell wall that keeps these cells apart and uh, Suggest therefore that plants have evolved unique ways to coordinate their cell polarities. And we believe that understanding how veins are patterned in leaves will give us, will gain us an understanding of how plants uniquely coordinate their cell polarities. And because I brought up uh, vein uh, patterning, uh, I want to introduce you to the main character of today's story, which is the vein pattern of an Arabidopsis leaf. And what you can see here, oh, what you can see here is a mid vein running through the, uh, the entire leaf, uh, surrounded by a series of loops on either end. And in yellow here, a finer network of minor veins, some of which end in the leaf tissue like this one, and some other ones that connect to pre-existing veins like this one I'm pointing at now. And one of the most, I think, intriguing uh, things for a developmental biologist is that this complex pattern arises from scratch with the development of every single leaf primordial. But there's another feature that is very interesting in this process because it's not like, um, for example, it's not that this vein pattern arises at a specific stage in leaf development and becomes more and more and more conspicuous as time goes by. After all, that's what happens to the so-called uh, veins in many insect wings. Uh, what happens instead is that this pattern is generated through the repeated addition of new veins to pre-existing ones with the formation of the mid vein first then the series of loops over here at the top of the leaf, then towards the bottom, the formation of the second series of loops, then, you know, not illustrating this cartoon, you would have more loops towards the base, and minor veins would start here at the top of the leaf, and minor vein formation would spread toward the bottom of the leaf. And so it seems that the developmental unit of this, of this network is the individual vein. So the question that we asked ourselves is, what are the signals that we know of that induce vein formation in, in plants? And uh, uh, there's a variety of different substances that have been reported to be able to trigger vascular cell differentiation. But so far, there's only one substance that can uh, organize this differentiation along continuous lines to give rise to veins. And that's the plant hormone oxy. Because if you apply oxy to a, uh, oxy here is this brown blob over here, to uh, a, uh, plant tissue, what you get is the formation of veins that will connect the applied source of oxygen to pre-existing veins, like the one here in green, basally to the point of oxygen application. And this uh, vascular differentiation response has very peculiar properties. The first one is that it's local. If you apply oxygen here, you're gonna see veins forming from the point of oxygen application and not elsewhere. It is polar because the veins will always be forming towards what is or what used to be the basal side of the plaque. In other words, if you apply oxygen over here, you won't get any formation of veins going to what is or what used to be the, the apical side of the plaque. Um, the response is continuous because as you can see here, these cells differentiate in continuity with one another to give rise to uh, an interrupted strength. So there's no gaps in these veins. And it is also restricted in the radio dimension. And what I mean by this is that 
as you may be able to uh, see here, uh, there's a lot of cell files that are in contact with the blob of oxygen, with the source of oxygen, but only some of them, the ones that are depicted here in brown, give rise to veins. But in between these brown lines, or these brown cell files, there's lots of cell files that are in contact here in black, that are in contact with the oxygen source, and yet do not differentiate into, uh, into veins. And finally, um, this response requires the use of transport, the auxins that we know are transported polarly in plants. Um, this suggests that the auxin-induced vascular differentiation response recruits polar cues, polar signals that already are present in plant tissues and that probably are one and the same with the polar transport of auxin. Because indeed, auxin is uh, synthesized primarily in the apical immature parts of the plant and transported towards the base of the plant, mainly through vascular cell files. And this apex to bottom direction of oxygen transport is accomplished at the cellular level through the asymmetric localization of exporters, oxygen exporters of the pin formed or pin family at the basal side of oxygen transporting cells such that uh, once we know the direction of these, um, uh, the localization of these auxin transporters, auxin exporters, we can infer the direction of auxin transport. And in Arabidopsis, there is eight pin proteins and eight pin genes. And uh, Megan, in my lab, had shown that uh, of all these eight pin genes, pin one is the only one with non-redundant functions in vein patterns. What that means is that the pin one single mutant is the only single pin mutant with vein pattern defects. All the other seven uh, pin mutants look completely normal. And so in order to uh, infer biologically relevant directions of oxygen transport and uh, cell polarities, we and others characterize the expression and localization of pin one during leaf development, which is what I try to illustrate in the next couple of cartoons. Uh, uh, this summarizes the work of, of a number of different uh, labs. And what it turns out is that uh, in the epidermis of the shoot tip, this layer, this outer layer of cells that you see over here, um, directions of oxygen transport and cell polarity seem to point towards uh, discrete locations in the shoot apex that represent the points where later on a new leaf primordial will be found. And these convergence points of P1 polarity in the epidermis are associated with these broad domains of P1 expression that over time narrow down to a single cell file that transports oxygen towards the bottom of the plant and predicts the position where the new mid vein will be formed. And just like the formation of the mid vein, the formation of lateral veins in the leaf is associated with the emergence of. Uh, convergence points of P1 polarity in the marginal epidermis, which are associated with these broad domains of P1 expression, which narrow down to individual cell files that transport oxygen from the margin to the mid vein. And unlike the mid vein and the lateral veins, these minor veins seem to form without any relationship to um, epidermal convergence points of P1 polarity. Instead, they branch off pre-existing veins, and initially they are connected to pre-existing veins only on one side, and they transport oxygen towards these veins they connect. But given enough time, they can connect to pre-existing veins on both ends, and this generates two opposite polarities at the ends of these veins, and these polarities are integrated by the formation of a bipolar cell, a cell that presumably transports oxygen in both directions, and that, is, uh, that appears somewhere along the length of this vein. And the minor veins that form uh, from the lateral veins typically extend towards the tip of the leaf and they connect to distal veins. And upon this connection, we have, just like in the case of minor veins that are connected on both ends, we have two opposite polarities. And then once again, these opposite polarities are integrated by the formation of a bipolar cell somewhere along the length of this vein. So I think it's, uh, I hope it's clear that we're talking about coordinating the polarity during vein formation of even in the smaller Arabidopsis leaf of hundreds of cells 
coordinated markedly of these hundreds of cells at the same time. And if you think that there are leaves that are as big as I am, you can imagine what it means to coordinate the uh, polarity of uh, these uh, gigantic leaves, thousands of cells, the polarity of thousands of cells has to be coordinated for these veins to be formed. And what, what controls this coordination? Well, uh, we don't know for sure, uh, but an hypothesis had been proposed about 25 years ago. And this hypothesis formulated, proposed that the gnome protein, which is a, a protein that is involved in vesicle formation, in uh, membrane trafficking in the cell and protein localization, would be responsible for localizing pin proteins to the bottom side of the cell. And this would generate a cell-to-cell -cell polar transport of auxin, which would propagate cell polarity and would lead to the formation of veins. Now, according to this hypothesis and consistent with this hypothesis, if you uh, look at the, uh, the localization of pin proteins in gnome mutant embryos, what it looks like is that, yes, they may be still polar, uh, but the polarity is not as coordinated as it is in the wild type. Presumably, this, according to the hypothesis, would give rise to uh, abnormal directions of oxygen transport, or perhaps even no net oxygen transport altogether, and lead to masses of vascular cells as opposed to veins. Now, so what the hypothesis basically states, in other words, is that the the vascular defects, whatever the vascular defects of a gnome mutant are, those vascular defects would be only the result of the inability of the mutant to properly localize pin proteins. And which is what is also illustrated in this diagram. And just a word of caution, these diagrams are not biochemical pathways. These are genetic interaction uh, diagrams. So sometimes the, you will see the arrows going in uh, counterintuitive directions uh, with respect to where they would go if they were connecting successive steps in a biochemical pathway, which they are not. But basically the hypothesis, um, so the vascular defects of GNOME result from the inability of the mutant to uh, coordinate beam polarity, uh, generates at least three predictions that were never tested, that had never been tested before Megan first in my lab, and then Carla, Shri, and Lin decided to do so. And the first prediction that they tested was that the uh, restriction of P1 expression domains and the polarization of P1 localization that normally occurs in uh, leaf development, in wild leaf development, would be abnormal or would fail to occur altogether in a gnome mutant leaf. And to test this prediction, we looked at, we imaged P1 expression in developing leaves in wild type and in gnome. And this is what you see here is, is a series of wild type uh, leaves at progressive stages of leaf development. And at early stages of leaf development, you see uh, P1 is expressed pretty much in all the cells. And over time, two things happen. In the epidermis, so the outer layer of the leaf, the expression becomes constricted, confined to the base of most epidermal cells of the leaf. And the inner tissue expression become gradually confined to individual cell files that mark the position where the new veins were before. Now, also in GNOME, at early stages of leaf development, P1 is expressed in all the cells. And over time, the expression in the epidermis becomes restricted to the basalmost epidermal cells. But unlike in wild type, the inner tissue expression never becomes restricted to individual cell files and remains pretty much ubiquitous even at very late stages of leaf development, suggesting that our result, oh, uh, before that, sorry, um, uh, another way for us to, sorry, I'm a little distracted because I see, I don't know if you see this, but I keep on seeing, maybe it's mine, uh, maybe there's a disease here, but um, I see things moving occasionally when I change the, the slides. Do you see anything like this? No? No, okay. Um, uh, anyway, um, we, we further tested this hypothesis uh, by um, imaging the localization of P1 proteins, uh, which in, you didn't see it moving now. No, 
Oh my goodness. Okay, <laughs> so I guess <laughs> after this talk, <laughs> I will take a longer break. <laughs> I'm sorry. I apologize, but uh, it threw me a drink after the subject. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> threw me off. I'm sorry. Um, the uh, uh, pin one, as you can see in, in wild type, in uh, veins, in developing veins, at, at a stage. Oh, so I see oh okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go. <laughs> oh, that's good. Okay. Um, it's localized mainly to the side of the plasma membrane that faces the pre existing veins it will connect to, for example, the mid vein in this case. Now, we've already seen that ignore this, this narrowing down of P1 expression domains will not happen. And so the domains will remain ubiquitous even at very late stages, but that's not the only thing that will happen. What happens is also that polarity is not very well defined. You see how it's very well defined over here, but here it seems that most of the cells uh, localize P1 at all plasma membrane sites. And if there is a weak polarity, occasionally you can find it at the edges of these higher expression domains, and sometimes at later stage, even at the center of these domains, but the polarity seems to point nowhere. It seems to be completely uncoordinated and pointing random directions. So what we can say is that our results seem to be supporting the first of the uh, three predictions of these hypotheses. But as I said, there's two more that we need to test. Um, the second one is that if the vascular defects of a gnome mutant result from the complete loss of pin-mediated oxygen transport, you would expect that once you remove the function of all the pin genes that are involved in vascular development, you will end up with a mutant that looks like gnome, right? And uh, in order to address this, this, uh, this question, we first had to understand what gnome mutants really look like because this had never been uh, looked in detail. So we, we identified and characterized more than 10 different mutant alleles in GNOME. Each of these mutants has uh, different amounts of residual GNOME function from uh, almost wild type function to complete uh, loss of, um, of GNOME function. And here I've only uh, shown, I'm only showing an intermediate mutant allele of GNOME, one that has only partially lost uh, GNOME function. And here you see two strong alleles of GNOME. And what you see in here, you see a wild type leaf. And I, I think it's already clear that already in an inter intermediate mutant, we see that the vein network becomes denser, the veins become thicker, veins start to lose their alignment with one another until, you know, as you progress towards stronger mutants, basically, the vein network turns into a mass of vascular cells that are accumulated randomly in the center of the developing leaf. So the question for us now is, if we knock out enough pin genes, can we obtain something that looks remotely close to some of these defects? Uh, the answer is no. Not in the pin one single mutant, not in the pin one three four seven quadruple mutant, and not even in the pin one three four six seven eight sextuple mutant which abolishes the function of all the pin genes that uh, have a role in vascular development. And we obtain the same results when we treat a uh, wild type with this NPA, which is a, an oxygen transport inhibitor that binds the pin proteins and inhibits their function stably. Um, so it would suggest, it our results would seem to uh, be unable to support the predictions of these hypotheses. But as I said, there's a, there's a third prediction that we need to take into account, is that if instead of resulting from complete loss of P-mediated oxygen transport, the vascular defects of GNOME result from abnormal directions of oxygen transport. For example, oxygen is being pumped by pin gene, pin proteins up instead of down. Okay? What you would expect in that case is that if you remove all the pin proteins that have a role in vascular development, for example, in the P1, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 6 type of mutant, uh, at that point, whether the known protein is there or not should make no difference. Because according to the hypothesis, the only targets, the only effectors of GNOME function in vein pattern are the pin proteins. Once the pin proteins are no longer there, 
you know, will have nothing to, to do, basically, according to the original hypothesis. And so this uh, experimentally equates to saying that a mutant that has lost all the six pins and you know, would look like a mutant that has lost all the pin genes. Uh, but what we find is exactly the opposite, because the pin, the gnome pin one three four six seven eight septuple mutant looks just like gnome. And so once again, our results fail to support the predictions of the hypothesis. So it means to us that the hypothesis is at the very best incomplete, and that we need to supplement it with some additional information. And in what way? So our results suggest that when you, when you have uh, P mutants, P mutants have a residual vein pattern activity that you know, it's encoded in some hypothetical pathway over here, and that this pathway would be under the control of GNOME, just as the P mediated oxygen transport would be. The first question that we, we asked, of course, was whether this pathway had anything to do with oxygen itself. And uh, uh, in order to address this, we, uh, we leverage something that Megan, Philip, and Tyler found in my lab as they were developing a time-lapse imaging um, procedure uh, for vein development. And what they had found is that if you apply to a developing leaf uh, oxid to one side of the developing leaf, over time, you get the formation of a, of a vein that connects the applied oxid, in this case, to pre-existing veins, such as the meat vein over here. And so we reasoned that we could use the same test on Y-type and pin mutants to understand if the pin mutants had any residual responsiveness to these oxygen signals. And so if you do this in Y-type, what you see here is a fragment of a, of a, an area, a zoomed in area of a mature Y-type leaf. If you do this in Y-type, you get these extra veins forming from the point of oxygen application connecting to the to the mid vein basal to the point of oxygen application. The surprising thing was that we get the same in uh, the mutant too. We get lots of extra veins that connect the point of oxygen application to the pre-existing uh, vasculature, suggesting that these mutants have residual uh, ability to respond to oxygen signals. And immediately, of course, we wondered, okay, what would be the phenotype of a plant in which we, we uh, compromise both oxygen transport and oxygen signal transduction. And uh, to address this, we used uh, a chemical called PBA, which is an inhibitor of oxygen signal transduction. We used uh, mutations in exa one which lack a required post-translational modification of the oxygen receptor complex, and tier one FP2 double mutants, which are basically, uh, which lack the two uh, most important oxygen receptors in Arabidopsis. And whether by means of chemicals or by, mean of, by means of combining a variety of different mutations together, basically what we saw is an enhancement of the vascular defects that appear only, for example, in uh, oxygen signaling inhibited leaves or oxygen transport inhibited leaves, suggesting that these two pathways, oxygen signal transaction and oxygen transport, provide overlapping functions in vein pattern. But what was most interesting to us was that the, uh, the leaves in which both pathways are compromised resemble leaves that have partially lost GNOME function. This is a, an intermediate mutant of GNOME. And so that raised, raised the possibility that uh, the GNOME is upstream, both oxygen signaling and oxygen transport. In vein pattern. But if that was the case, you would imagine that just like GNOME has defects in oxygen transport, it would also have defects in oxygen responsiveness. And we should be able to recapitulate those defects by compromising, by inhibiting oxygen transport and oxygen signaling at the same time. And to test this, we used a synthetic reporter for oxygen signaling called dr 5 rad which you see here is accumulating at high levels in developing veins. And when in oxygen transport inhibited leaves, the expression of this reporter is very low and confined to the margin of the leaves. 
It's also very low in the XR1 mutant, but that's to be expected because the XR1 mutant is all positive control. It's a mutant that is defective in oxygen signal transduction. But if you increase laser settings way above the wild type, you can see that in this mutant, uh, the expression of DR5, these high levels of oxygen responsiveness are still localized to the developing veins. Now, in both a gnome mutant and in leaves that are compromised for both oxygen signaling and oxygen transport, the expression of DR5 is nearly undetectable. Um, and if you push the lasers hard enough to be able to see whatever is left of this expression, you will see that the expression is scattered over large areas of the, of the leaf, suggesting that GNOME indeed has defects in auxin responsiveness, and we can recapitulate those defects by inhibiting, at the same time, auxin signaling and auxin transport. So that would be consistent with the idea that, that uh, GNOME is upstream of auxin signaling, just like it is upstream of, of auxin transport, but we have an actual genetic assay to test this, because if we create, for example, a mutant uh, between the GNOME mutant and the XR1 mutant, we would expect that if GNOME is genetically upstream of XR1, that the double mutant would look like GNOME. Just like if you remember the uh, septuple mutant GNOME P134678 looks like GNOME. And indeed, this is what happens. The double mutant looks no different from the single mutant GNOME which suggests to us that indeed GNOME is upstream of both oxygen signaling and oxygen transport in vein patterning. But is it also upstream of the coordination of cell polarity that precedes vein patterning? Uh, well, to test this, we used uh, PIN1 uh, expression and localization. And I think the most important points over here are that at early stages in both an intermediate mutant of GNOME and in, mutant, in leaves that are compromised for both auxin signaling and auxin transport, P1 is initially expressed in very, in very broad domains. But the interesting thing is that these domains fail to narrow down to individual cell files, which instead they do in wild type, in auxin signaling inhibited leaves, and in auxin transport inhibited leaves. So they fail to do so, they narrow down to some clusters of cells, in which polarity is not as well coordinated as it is in all the other control leaves, suggesting that indeed uh, GNOME controls these two pathways, both in the coordination of cell polarity and in the vein pattern that derives from that coordination. But this is not all. Uh, why am I saying that? Because in the best case scenario, when we inhibit by means of chemicals or mutations, when we inhibit uh, oxygen signaling and oxygen transport, at best, we are able to phenocopy an intermediate mutant allele of GNOME. We're never able to get close to the defects that you see here in a strong GNOME mutant. To us, that suggests that, uh, that basically there must be at least one more pathway that is uh, acting together with oxygen transport and oxygen signaling in vein pattern, and that pathway has to be under the control of GNOME. And Lean, in my lab, um, hypothesized that this pathway depends on the movement of an oxygen signal through these plasma desmata uh, intercellular channels. So these are these orange channels that connect the cytoplasm, the cytoplasms of uh, contiguous cells, and that span the entire width of the cell wall. So what he hypothesizes is that auxin or, or an auxin dependent signal would move from cell to cell through these channels. Well, if that's the case, you would expect that mutants that are unable to regulate the width of these channels, uh, mutants that have always open channels, the mutants that have always open um, um, channels would have defects in vein pattern. And to test this, we use two classes of, of mutants, the GSL8 mutants, which have near constitutively open channels, and the class 3D gain of function mutants, which have near constitutively closed channels. And uh, 
both mutants gave rise to similar defects. Uh, very few veins were produced. These, uh, the loops that normally are closed in a wild type are typically open, veins are fragmented, and in the worst case scenario, you have, instead of a nice linear arrangement of vascular cells into veins, you have clusters of randomly uh, oriented and aligned uh, vascular cells. And these defects seem to be preceded by defects in coordination of cell polarity, exemplified here by P1 localization to any of the basically of the plasma membrane sites facing a continued contiguous P1 expressing cell, as opposed to what happens in wild type, where P1 is localized towards the pre existing veins this domain connects to. Uh, what we, we found particularly interesting, the fact that both classes of mutant gave rise to the same defects. So whether they are open or closed, we ended up with the same defects. And to us, that suggested that uh, the plasma is not opening, that, like, the opening of these channels changed during the course of leaf development. And these changes, uh, these changes were particularly important for vein patterning. So we had to find a way to visualize these changes in, in permeability of these channels. And so Lean devised a tool whereby the GAL4 VP16 chimeric transcription factor would be activated by a variety of different tissue specific enhancers of our choice, such that this transcription factor would be activated in our in, uh, tissue of choice. And this, this GAL4 VP16 transcription factor would activate two genes the production of uh, an endoplasmic reticulum green fluorescent protein, which cannot move through the channels, and a soluble cytoplasmic yellow fluorescent protein, which instead can move through the channels. So the idea was that suppose that we use a, uh, we activate GAL4 VP16 only in the veins of a leaf. This is where GAL4 is produced. This is where you will produce both GFP and YFP. And this is where you will see when you detect GFP. Now, if the plasma desmata between the veins and the surrounding non-vascular tissues are, say, closed, you expect that YFP would still also be detected in the veins, just like GFP. If instead these plasma desmata, these channels are open, you would find uh, YFP in other tissues too. And the data that I will show you now derive mostly from the use of uh, vascular specific enhancers. So uh, by which we express GAL4, we produce GAL4, ER, GFP, and YFP in the veins. But we've done this with all sorts of tissue specific enhancers and the picture that emerges is exactly the same. But for the sake of simplicity, I will only show a few images here. But basically what you can see is that while at early stages of leaf development, when GFP, is confined to the veins, basically YFP is pretty much everywhere. Suggesting that at early stages, the channels are between the veins and the surrounding tissues are wide open. But they don't remain wide open forever because once uh, in a region of the leaf, you've reached a region of the leaf where veins are no longer forming, like this one at the top of this uh, later stage of leaf, uh, at this point, you see that the, uh, the permeability of the plasma desmata, the channels between the vein and the surrounding tissue drops to a minimum, whereas in the region where new veins are being formed, this uh, permeability remains high. Um, okay, so uh, it looks like at some point, the permeability between veins, vascular tissues, and non-vascular tissues decreases. But what about the permeability of the individual vascular cells that form the veins? Are they also uh, losing this connection or are they still connected with respect to one another? And to do so, to test this, we uh, express GAL4, uh, VP16 in uh, segments of veins. So what you see here, uh, um, this is a mid vein and a loop over here. And uh, mind, these are not mutants. These are perfectly wild type leaves. Uh, it means that these, these plants have continuous veins over here. The only thing is that GAL4 is only activated in segments of these veins. 
And as you can see, uh, GFP is retaining these segments, but YFP basically moves throughout the entire vein, which would suggest to us that even when veins are no longer connected by channels uh, to their surrounding tissues, they're still connected with one another uh, within each individual vein. And if these changes are relevant, if these changes that we observe in PD permeability and channel permeability are relevant for vein patterning, you would expect that they are modified, that they are abnormal in the mutants that have altered aperture of the channels. The very same mutant that I showed you have these, these vein pattern defects. And this is indeed what we find. For example, in mutants that have near constitutively closed channels, YFP doesn't move much beyond the vasculature. So this stage is comparable to this stage over here. You see, there is a little bit of movement here, but for the most part, uh, YFP is going nowhere. On the other hand, uh, in the, the opposite class of mutants, you know, the mutants that have these open channels, what happens is that uh, you never get eventually the restriction of YFP localization to individual uh, vascular tissues. It remains pretty much ubiquitous throughout the, the leaf, which suggests that um, now we know that PD permeability, the permeability of these channels change, changes during leaf development, and these changes matter for vein back. But if you remember, what Lean had hypothesized is that uh, it's an oxygen signal that moves through these channels. So we reason that if that was the case, in mutants that have effect, that have problems in regulating the size of these channels, we would have defects in oxygen-induced vein formation. That means that if we apply, you remember, if we apply oxygen to a developing leaf, uh, we get the formation of a vein that uh, forms from the point of oxygen application and connects the pre-existing veins like the mid vein in this case. Now, if we do this in a background that is defective in the regulation of the aperture of the chain uh, of the channels, and you know, for the sake of simplicity, I will only show you data from now on coming from one of these classes of mutants, the ones that only have near constitutively open channels. But we have, of course, the, the, uh, the complementary set of results. And actually, um, Lean uh, will defend on September 27th, uh, eight o'clock, the seminar is. Uh, and uh, um, so if any of you is interested in actually hearing uh, also all the results regarding this story that I won't be able to tell you today, you're uh, welcome to attend his seminar at eight o'clock on September 27, eight o'clock in the morning, uh, September 27. Um, and um, what happens when we do it with, with a, a mutant that is unable to regulate this, this opening and closing of the channels. Well, we do get some, some response, but only in about 20% of the leaves as opposed to 90% of the leaves, suggesting that, um, that indeed the ability to regulate this channel is required for uh, oxygen-induced vascular differentiation. But it also raised the possibility that perhaps oxygen um, acts to induce vein formation by controlling the uh, opening and closing of these channels. But now we, we have a way to test this because we, we have used the tool that Lean had generated. And as you can see here, at a stage of leaf development at which the, uh, the permeability between veins and surrounding tissue is already towards the minimum, the permeability is already is still very high in leaves of the same stage at which we had applied oxygen. But this is only a relative change because if you give it enough time, later on, the, uh, the permeability will also drop to a minimum between veins and surrounding vascular tissue, non-vascular tissue, suggesting that oxygen simply delays this reduction in, in uh, channel permeability. But if you remember, we, we hypothesized that this was a pathway that was acting together with oxygen transport and oxygen signaling in vein patterning. Uh, for the moment, we have no evidence that, that this is the case, but we have ways to test this because 
you would imagine that if this was the case, if these two pathways were acting together in vein patterning, they provided overlapping functions, defects uh, induced by oxygen transport inhibition would be enhanced by defects in the ability to regulate channel aperture. And in contrast to oxygen transport inhibited leaves or leaves that have defects in the aperture, the regulation of the ch channel aperture, leaves that are inhibited in both pathways show great enhancements of vascular defects. We have lots of veins now formed that run parallel to one another to form uh, a, very, a very wide mid vein that spans almost the entire width of the, of the leaf. So that also uh, raises the possibility that oxygen transport inhibition, just like oxygen application, may act through modifying these, these channels, the aperture of this channel interferes with this process. And once again, we can test this with Lean's uh, tool, and we can see that in leaves in which uh, these uh, permeability between veins and surrounding non-vascular tissues has dropped to a minimum, in oxygen transport inhibitor state uh, leaves, this permeability is still very high throughout the entire leaf. But as in the case of oxygen application, this is just a relative change. Over time, if you give it enough time, this permeability will also drop to a minimum. Uh, so it seems that oxygen, appli uh, oxygen application and oxygen transport inhibition both delays the normal reduction in aperture of these uh, channels. But it also, of course, raises the, the opposite possibility that not, on that not only oxygen transport inhibition interferes with, uh, with the permeability of these plasma desmata channels, but that uh, the regulation of plasma desmata channel aperture is important for oxygen transport. And to test this, we imaged uh, PIN1. PIN1 is, remember, is the, the single member of the uh, family of oxygen transporters that has non-redundant functions in vein patterning. And what I want you to focus on here is that from early on, these domains are continuous. There is no break in these domains. There are no gaps in the expression of P1. Uh, this is true also in mutants that have problems with uh, regulation of uh, plasma desmata aperture, uh, but not at the beginning. At the beginning, these domains seem to be open, but, uh, sorry, closed, but over time, uh, regions in these domains become uh, start to lose P1 expression, and eventually they give rise to these fragmented domains of P1 expression that foreshadow the, uh, the defects that we see in maturity, suggesting that somehow the, uh, the inability to regulate the opening and closing of these channels interferes with the maintenance of P continuity of P1 expression domains, not with the establishment of this continuity because these domains are continuous at early stages, but they break down over time. So then I think it's safe to say that, that these two pathways provide overlapping functions in vein patterning, uh, which brings us to the possibility that now we have to test that these two pathways, oxygen signaling and regulated PD aperture, perform these overlapping functions. And at concentrations of oxygen signaling inhibitors that basically lead to no defects in one type, the same concentrations, if applied to backgrounds that have defects in oxygen, sorry, in a PD aperture regulation in the aperture of plasma desmata, they nearly completely abolish vein uh, formation. And in order to see something even remotely similar, we need to increase in wild type the concentration of these signaling inhibitors way above the original concentration. Um, and once again, you know, immediately we once we establish that the vascular phenotype of the of the leaves that are compromised in both processes, oxygen signaling and regulation of channel aperture, uh, the fact that these phenotypes are enhanced suggests that they are providing overlapping functions, these pathways, we immediately were interested, inspired by what we had done with oxygen transport and oxygen signaling to understand whether these two 
pathways affected one another. And um, it seems that they do, uh, but in this case, what happens when you inhibit oxygen signaling in the leaf, it seems that you are accelerating the, uh, uh, the wave of reduction of closing of these uh, channels, opposite to what we had seen with respect to oxygen application and oxygen transport inhibition. And uh, if we test whether regulation of channel aperture controls oxygen response, which we can do, you may remember, through this synthetic oxygen reporter called tier 5 rev um, Once again, in wild type, we see that tier uh, 5 rev so oxygen responsiveness is maximum in narrow domains that correspond to the sites where new veins are being formed. These domains are much weaker in, in leaves that are compromised in the regulation of channel aperture. And if you push the laser up to see the full extent of these domains, which are much weaker, we can see that these domains are also broader than we can see in, in wild type. Suggesting that these three pathways regulate one another and contribute together to vein patterning. But what regulates these path pathways? Well, we know that GNOME regulates oxygen transport and oxygen signaling in this process. Is it possible that, that GNOME regulates also regulated channel aperture? And uh, to test this, we know that we have a simple genetic assay to do to uh, test this, this uh, question, to test this prediction, because uh, if we create a mutant between GNOME and a mutant that is impacted, that is affected in the regulation of PD aperture, we expect that this mutant would look like GNOME, just like in the case of the GNOME XR1 double mutant and the GNOME P1 multiple mutant. And this is indeed what we find, that the GNOME GSLA double mutant is no different from the GNOME single mutant, suggesting that indeed GNOME is genetically upstream of this pathway as it is upstream of oxygen transport and oxygen signaling. But if that was the case, the GNOME mutant would have defects in regulation of channel aperture, just like it has defects in oxygen signaling and it has defects in oxygen transport. But thanks again to Lean's tool, we can test this possibility. And what you see here is that both in wild type and in the mutant, uh, GFP and therefore GAL4 are restricted to developing vascular tissues. And that just like in wild type, in GNOME at early stages, we detect YFP all around the tissue. So YFP is not confined to the sole vascular tissues, but I'm sure you can appreciate that the the extent of this diffusion is much more limited than in the wild type. And at later stages of development, uh, in, at stages at which the uh, permeability of the uh, channels between veins and surrounding vas non-vascular tissues started to decrease in the upper portion of the leaf, we see something similar only at the bottom of the leaf. And instead, the plasmodesmata in the upper part of the leaf are wide open, even though they don't seem to be as wide open as they are in wild type, because you can still see some differences between vascular tissues and non-vascular tissues. But overall, this to us suggests that indeed GNOME has defects in regulation of PD aperture, just like it has defects in oxygen transport and oxygen signaling. And so the next question for us, of course, was finally, well, if you remember when we started this part, knowing that when we inhibit oxygen signaling and oxygen transport, we can only phenocopy a mutant that has only partially lost genome expression. So now the question for us was, okay, what happens if we inhibit all three pathways? Are we able to get anywhere closer to what a complete loss of function of genome looks like? And the answer seems yes, because as opposed to what you see here in wild type where vascular cells differentiate in continuity with one another to form veins, once you inhibit all three pathways, vascular cells accumulate in these, in these uh, shapeless masses 
in the middle of the leaf, uh, perhaps even more severe than what we can see in the GNOME single mutant background. Suggesting to us that vein patterning is the result of GNOME dependent toxin signaling, oxygen transport, and regulated PD aperture. And in wild type, what would happen is that the coordination of these three pathways, oxygen signaling, the polar transport from cell to cell of oxygen, and the ex axial movement of uh, oxygen or an oxygen dependent signal through plasma desmata would contribute to pattern vascular cells into veins. And in the absence of their upstream regulator, you know, these vascular cells will still be formed, but they would fail to, uh, to be patterned together into coherent veins, and they would accumulate as masses in the, uh, in the center of the leaf. But how, how can we know a single protein do all of these things? Um, well, the, uh, the short answer is that we, we don't know, but that's what we intend to uh, find out. And this is where um, efforts have been focusing in my lab for the last uh, few years. Uh, for example, um, Shri and Brindy have identified uh, proteins that are produced in response to oxygen signaling, that are the response to oxygen application. And these proteins mediate uh, oxygen functions in vein patterning. And the localization, these proteins localize to the plasma membrane, and their localization depends on GNOME. At the same time, Brindy and Drew, for example, have identified mutations that are able, mutations in genes other than GNOME, that are able, however, to normalize the phenotype of a GNOME mutant, giving us some clues about additional pathways they may, that GNOME may be interacting with. And uh, as Declan was saying during my sabbatical, I had entirely different plans, but uh, when I got there, um, uh, one of the first things that I did uh, was to give a couple of talks on campus to, uh, to you know, get myself known and uh, let people know about what I was working on. And, uh, and Mark Rossian came up to me, he's a biochemist, and, uh, and basically he told me that we could immediately isolate basically uh, all, the, all the proteins that are included, that are uh, contained in, in vesicles that are associated with uh, GNOME proteins. At the time, GNOME protein, we figured that GNOME, uh, this is something that we found later on, uh, GNOME is localized to a subset of the Golgi uh, apparatus and also to vesicles that are responsible for either directing uh, proteins to the plasma membrane or recycle them to the plasma membrane via endocytosis. And, um, and we have labeled these vesicles with uh, GNOME GFP and GNOME YFP. And we were able, with, Mark, with Mark's help, we were able to identify all the proteins that are uh, localized, all the proteins, well, at least some of the proteins, I don't know if they're all, uh, some of the proteins that are contained in this vesicle. And at the same time, we uh, have started to characterize how uh, the localization of, of uh, all the proteins that we could detect in the Arabidopsis proteome change their localization upon progressive loss of GNOME function, which would give us an idea of, at a more systemic level, what happens when uh, cells start to lose um, GNOME function. And we hope that we're going to be able, uh, in about in another maybe 10, 20 years, uh, to <laughs> I hope that I will be able to give another talk, uh, you know, just before maybe retirement, and tell you, you know, uh, how GNOME basically is able to perform all these functions I've been telling you about in vein patterning. Uh, but with this, for the moment, uh, I'd like to uh, end by thanking uh, the people who contributed to the work that I presented today, the, um, the time lapse of oxygen application and vein patterning was done by Megan, Philip, and Tyler. Uh, Megan was also the one who started the work on the um, on vein patterning by GNOME-dependent oxygen transport and signaling, work that was taken to completion by Carla, uh, 
by Shri and Lin. And Lin uh, was also uh, single-handedly responsible for the work that I shown you on, um, on uh, vein patterning by gnome-dependent regulation of plasma desmata aperture. And I just remind you that he will be defending on September 27, eight o'clock in the morning, if you want to hear some of these other things that he's been doing in, in, uh, during his PhD, you're welcome to attend that, um, that seminar. Uh, nothing of this would have been possible if not for the generosity of the North American Arabidopsis Biological Resource Center and uh, the uh, generosity of a number of colleagues around the world who selflessly uh, made resources available to us and the, of course the financial support of the agencies that believed in this research. So with this, I'd like to end by thanking again Declan for the opportunity, you for the attention, and I will be happy to take questions. Fantastic, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, well, we, we'd like to open up the questions and at, at some point I may quickly check the sure. Zoom link to see if there are any questions that have popped up there as well. Uh, but please, any questions? Uh, Zach and then Jens. Uh, it was a great talk. Thank the, you. Um, so later on in your talk, discontinuity in veins seem to be a pretty prominent or key factor. Yeah. Um, my question is just uh, what stops the vein normally? Because I know you mentioned, I think you mentioned some veins will just stop, not feel it. Yes. Um, well, we, we have, uh, uh, at this moment, we have two, um, um, it's two possibilities for a vein to end. Um, we don't know whether these two mechanisms uh, speak to each other because they've been isolated independently, but nobody has ever done any experiment to see if they are integrated, but uh, if they are maybe two sides of the same story. But one of them is um, basically the uh, uh, exhausting of the oxygen signal in the, in during the leaf, when, when the leaf develops. Um, the, uh, uh, the cells, as they divide, they produce uh, oxygen, but when they stop dividing, they uh, stop producing oxygen. And uh, this may be uh, you know, one of the reasons why, when, when that happens, that the vein stops. The other uh, phenomenon, which may be related to what I was just saying now, but has been identified as an independent mechanism, um, is that uh, at one point during leaf development, um, Basically, the, the cells that have not been selected towards vascular fate will differentiate into, into the photosynthetic tissue of the leaf. It's called mesophyll. It's what you know, leaves use uh, to photosynthesize. And the differentiation of this of these tissue goes in a sort of like an apex to base direction as the leaves. And it sort of like freezes the, uh, uh, let's say, the, the picture. Basically, the moment uh, vascular cells, uh, sorry, the, the cells that are in the inner tissues that have not been selected towards vascular fate take on the mesophyll fate, they become insensitive to oxygen. Not even if you apply oxygen at that point, you're able to, uh, to induce uh, vascular differentiation. So at that point, they lose the ability to respond to the signal. Thank you. Yes? So fantastic, Anika. Um, I was Thanks. thinking about comparisons to what we know about the FT story in, um, in dormancy acquisition. Or yes. in it. And in that case, we've got plasma dosmata where the core aperture um, is constricted and then it's reversed to become unconstricted. But here we have a one way trip, I guess, that, that you're going from a larger aperture to a smaller aperture. And I'm assuming that that's a one way, it's irreversible. Do you know? No, it, it actually, well, we don't know for, for, from our own studies, but um, what has been uh, like in the leaf, uh, plasma does not have been studied uh, for a long time because of the, uh, this is the way that uh, sugars move through phloem in the, uh, in the leaf. And the, this is how sugars that are produced by these photosynthetic tissues are loaded onto the veins. And then, you know, they're taken to basically uh, areas of the plant that do not photosynthesize and they need these sugars. They report that the opposite uh, 
happens that plasma and asthmata are initially closed, but then they open in order to allow these, these um, sugars to enter the vasculature. Um, but what, we, uh, what seems to be the case is comparing those studies and ours is that uh, basically their, uh, their studies are done at a much later stage of leaf development when basically um, not only the pattern uh, of veins is established, but they have already completely differentiated into mature vascular tissues. Um, so what I suspect, we have never tested it with our own uh, material, but what I suspect is that um, after they've been closed, at a similar, certain point during development, uh, in selected places, they will reopen again to allow this, this movement of, of sugars. But this is just a speculation based on our result and you know, results done by other people with different techniques. Certainly what they've done is at much later stages. So this is my, my way of rationalize the fact that uh, we have two opposite trends that however, seem to happen at very different times during leaf development. So, so if that's the case, and that makes sense to me, I buy that. Um, do you think that it's deposition of car carbohydrates, or do you think it's uh, more protein-based that this aperture is being regulated? Yes. I mean, we're into rank speculation, so let's the, just speculate all we want. We know for sure that uh, Carlos deposition is involved. In fact, the mutants that we used, which are the mutants that are most commonly used, for these uh, processes, for these studies, are mutants that are uh, either an, uh, loss of function mutants in, in, in genes that are supposed to produce proteins that synthesize callos at, specifically at the plasma desmata, or uh, uh, there's also a series of mutants that I haven't shown, mutants that are uh, degrading callos. At. So callos seems to be a very important uh, mechanism by which these, these uh, uh, this can be regulated, this aperture can be regulated. But uh, the short answer, of course, is that we don't know exactly what other mechanisms are at play. In other tissues, uh, other mechanisms have been um, uh, proposed. For example, in the root, as the, as the root elongates and the vascular cells elongates in the root, basically what happens is that the new material, the new cell wall plasma membrane that is formed as these cells elongate, uh, they fail to contain any plasmaless matter. So basically, uh, you, you end up having the same number of plasmaless matter that you had when the cell was a square, but now this, it's a rectangle and you still have the same number of plasmaless matter. So they, they infer that the permeability per area would be reduced. So that's one possibility. Uh, they've also observed that um, that some of these plasma desmata, which are illustrated as straight channels, um, as development proceeds, they can coalesce into some sort of branched structure. And here, you know, until very recently, the idea was that this branched plasma desmata would have lower permeability than uh, the simple ones, the one. But recently, there was a report that they report the opposite. They say, well, we measured it, uh, but you know, it's difficult because it's difficult to compare because one was a report that was maybe 20 years ago with different techniques and the methods that were up to date at that point. Now there's a new method, but uh, it's unclear how the two relate. So these are some of the most, uh, the ones that I'm, I'm thinking about, uh, but uh, unfortunately this requires, uh, uh, we had a collaboration that fell through uh, um, in trying to investigate this precisely, but it requires an enormous amount of TEM sections because th these plasma is matter or, or the ability to label precisely, to have markers of plasma is matter uh, that labels each and every one of them. And uh, the, the plasma is matter, it's a field has only become more active Recently, uh, there's a lot of movement in the area, but uh, with a lot of people that report the plasma desmata proteome, uh, but I'm waiting for them to, <laughs> to basically characterize a little bit more um, which markers are, are really, we have a few, but in my, in my experience, they don't seem to label all 
the plasma is matter. So I'm a bit, a bit uh, reluctant to, to infer too much from the analysis that we've done of those markers. My last question is um, a little bit more um, speculative. Please. Yes. Um, you know, we, we, uh, if auxin itself is the signal that's moving through the plasma desmata, not an auxin protein designate or something, uh, there's kind of an advantage there because it's a small molecule relative to, to proteins moving or, or larger mass molecular yeah. structures. So, do you think at some point, uh, Rather than just like a whole plug or whatever, that there there might be some size selection going on to progressively limit the signaling molecules that might be moving. Yes, I I, I think I think uh, uh, first of all, um, you know the uh, uh, I think uh, because oxygen is is diffusing uh, through these these channels, um, there's a side of the story that we we're interested in that. Uh, that we don't have uh, yet sufficient information on, but um, in order to understand the really the, the directions of this movement, it would be important to understand uh, where the sources of oxygen synthesis in the leaf are, because we know that the sinks of these are the veins, because they they transport they drain the leaf from that. Um, but I I do agree uh, that. Uh, that uh, I think that there has to be some sort of gradual, uh, you know, narrowing down of these of these say pores of these channels, um, and not only that, but I expect that there must be, you know, if this mechanism is all there is, uh, I suspect that there must be also a positive feedback between the uh, oxygen that goes through, and you know. These, these channels remain open, and if instead oxygen is not going through, these channels are gradually closed. Um, this is suggested by our oxygen application uh, experiments, and I think it's required because otherwise you would never be able to narrow down these, these very broad domains of permeability to individual cell files. I don't know if, if it helps a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it does. It kind of Jives with what Rishi is thinking about, but he's working behind closed doors, right? So yes, don't yes. really know. <laughs> Wait, I, I think uh, just going back to the Callos point. So, yes. like, could you scan for Callos and see if it's deposited along one axis? In... Yes, uh, it can be done. Uh, but we try that in in leaves. Um, this is different. This is done very easily in roots. Uh, but we've tried it in these with no success. Um, uh, it's very difficult to get, uh, you use aniline blue, yeah. and one of the problems with, with leaves, in general, even very, 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 very young leaves, is that, uh, that uh, basically they don't take up dyes very easily uh, because they immediately have a cuticle uh, very, from very early on. Their epidermis is uh, covered by a cuticle, and unless you do some massive wounding, of the of the leaf, uh, we were in contact with uh, it's a risky lab uh, who's been studying plasmodes matter for a long time, and we tried all th tricks that they could come up with, but nothing ever worked. Neither with with you, we can get something at the at the level of the epidermis, no problem, but to get this to penetrate deeply, you know, yes, we have to wound a lot, and you know, then then you get of course callus deposited because of wounding. And then everything stays with anything group. So um, yes, we, we, we try that. Because we, we did do some of this in my PhD because we were working with a virus that's able to open the plasma disorder to, yeah. to move. And that was in like a cell leaves, leaf, so they're pretty big. But I'd have to see the cold we exactly. Well, you can you can get something maybe in the layer. I don't know if you were able to. Uh, I've never seen any pictures of anything showing the vasculature. You know, I have seen pictures of uh, of the epidermis and something of the layer just below the epidermis, and that we could get to uh, if we waited long enough. We could get there, uh, but we never were able to uh, to get the, uh, to the to the level where the vasculature, which is a few layers uh, deep. Okay. We're just about out of time. I tell you that you're going to put your hand up. I just 
we, we're about quarter past four. So, but um, if there are other questions, please stay behind, and I'm sure Enrico won't mind <laughs> chat for a little bit. Um, and Enrico, as, as a, a token of Oh, uh, of our appreciation. Um, Thank you. I was like, what about? It might not seem like much, but we've been giving them to all of our, like, and so join the call. Thank you for the uh, faculty. Thank you. Very much. So, and again, thank you for such a wonderful talk. I have a question or two. I'll, yes. I'll wait till the end as well. Okay. So, thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks very much.